Sung Hui Cho was a South Korean mass murderer who killed 32 people and wounded 17 others on April 16, 2007, at the Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University in Blacksburg, Virginia. An additional six people were injured jumping from windows to escape. He was a senior-level undergraduate student at the university. The shooting rampage came to be known as the Virginia Tech shooting. Cho committed suicide after police breached the doors of the building where the majority of the shooting had taken place. His body is buried in Fairfax, Virginia. Born in South Korea, Cho arrived in the United States at the age of eight with his family. He became a U.S. permanent resident as a South Korean national. In middle school, he was diagnosed with a severe anxiety disorder known as selective mutism, as well as major depressive disorder. During Cho's last two years at Virginia Tech, several instances of his abnormal behavior, as well as plays and other writings he submitted containing references to violence, caused concern among teachers and classmates. In the aftermath of the shootings, Virginian Governor Tim Kaine convened a panel consisting of various officials and experts to investigate and examine the response and handling of issues related to the shootings. The panel released its final report in August 2007, devoting more than 30 pages to detailing Cho's troubled history. In the report, the panel criticized the failure of the educators and mental health professionals who came into contact with Cho during his college years to notice his deteriorating condition and help him. The panel also criticized misinterpretations of privacy laws and gaps in Virginia's mental health system and gun laws. In addition, the panel faulted Virginia Tech administrators in particular for failing to take immediate action after the first shootings. Nevertheless, the report did acknowledge that Cho was still primarily responsible for not seeking assistance and for his murderous rampage. Early Life and Education Cho was born on 18 January 1984 in the city of Asun, in South Korea's South Chungcheong province. Cho and his family lived in a basement apartment in the South Korean capital of Seoul for a couple of years before immigrating to the United States. Cho's father was self-employed as a bookstore owner, but made minimum wages from the venture, seeking better education and opportunities for his children. Cho's father immigrated to the United States in September 1992 with his wife and three children. Cho was eight years old at the time. The family first lived in Detroit, then moved to the Washington metropolitan area after learning that it had one of the largest South Korean expatriate communities in the U.S., particularly in Northern Virginia. Cho's family settled in Centerville, an unincorporated community in western Fairfax County, Virginia about 25 miles west of Washington, D.C. Cho's father and mother opened a dry cleaning business in Centerville. After the family moved to Centerville, Cho and his family became permanent residents of the United States as South Korean nationals. His parents became members of a local Christian church, and Cho himself was raised as a member of the religion. Although he railed against his parents' strong Christian faith, according to one report, Cho had left a note in his dormitory which contained a rant referencing Christianity and denigrating rich kids. In a video that Cho mailed to the NBC headquarters in New York he stated, Thanks to you I die like Jesus Christ. To inspire generations of the weak and defenseless people, family concerns about Cho's behavior during childhood A few members of Cho's family, those who remained in South Korea, had concerns about his behavior during his early childhood. Cho's relatives thought that he was selectively mute or mentally ill. According to Cho's uncle, Cho didn't say much and did not mix with other children. Cho's maternal great-aunt described Cho as cold and a cause of family concern from as young as eight years old. According to his great-aunt, who met him twice, Cho was extremely shy and just would not talk at all. He was otherwise considered well-behaved, a readily obeying verbal commands and cues. 
The great aunt said she knew something was wrong after the family's departure for the United States because she heard frequent updates about Cho's, her older sister, but little news about Cho. During an ABC News Nightline interview on August 30, 2007, Cho's grandfather reported his concerns about Cho's behavior during childhood. According to Cho's grandfather, Cho never looked up to him to make eye contact, never called him grandfather, and never moved to embrace him. Behavior in school Cho attended the Poplar Tree Elementary School in Chantilly, an unincorporated, small community in Virginia's Fairfax County. According to Kim Jong Won, who met Cho in the fifth grade and took classes with him, Cho finished the three-year program at Poplar Tree Elementary School in one and a half years. Cho was noted for being good at mathematics and English, and teachers pointed to him as an example for other students. At that time, according to Kim, nobody disliked Cho and he was recognized by friends as a boy of knowledge. A good dresser who was popular with the girls, Kim added that, I only have good memories about him. An acquaintance noted that, every time he came home from school he would cry and throw tantrums saying he never wanted to return to school. When Cho first came to the U.S., in about the second grade, in 1999, during the spring of Cho's eighth grade year, the Columbine High School massacre made international news. Cho was transfixed by it. I remember sitting in Spanish class with him, right next to him, and there being something written on his binder to the effect of, you know, F, you all, I hope you all burn in hell, which I would assume meant us, the students, said Ben Baldwin, a classmate of Cho. Also, Cho wrote in a school assignment about wanting to, repeat Columbine. The school contacted Cho's sister, who reported the incident to their parents. Cho was sent to a psychiatrist. Cho attended secondary schools in Fairfax County, including Ormond Stone Middle School in Centerville and Westfield High School in Chantilly, and by eighth grade had been diagnosed with selective mutism, a social anxiety disorder which inhibited him from speaking. Through high school, he was teased for his shyness and unusual speech patterns. According to Chris Davids, a high school classmate in Cho's English class at Westfield High School, Cho looked down and refused to speak when called upon. Davids added that, after one teacher threatened to give Cho a failing grade for not participating in class, he began reading in a strange, deep voice that sounded like he had something in his mouth. While several students recalled instances of Cho being teased and mocked at Westfield, most left him alone and later said they were not aware of his anger. Cho graduated from Westfield High School in 2003. Selective mutism diagnosis immediately after the incident, reports carried speculation by Cho's family members in South Korea that he was autistic. However, no known record exists to Cho ever being diagnosed with autism, nor could an autism diagnosis be verified with Cho's parents. The Virginia Tech Review Panel report dismissed an autism diagnosis and experts later doubted the autism claim. More than four months after the attack, the Wall Street Journal reported on August 20, 2007 that Cho had been diagnosed with selective mutism. The Virginia Tech Review Panel report, also released in August 2007, placed this diagnosis in the spring of Cho's eighth grade year, and his parents saw treatment for him through medication and therapy. In high school, Cho was placed in special education under the emotional disturbance classification. He was excused from oral presentations and participation in class conversation and received 50 minutes a month of speech therapy. He continued receiving mental health therapy as well until his junior year, when Cho rejected further therapy. To address his problems, Cho's parents also took him to church. According to a pastor at the Centerville Korean Presbyterian Church, Cho was a smart student who understood the Bible, but he was concerned about Cho's difficulty in speaking to people. The pastor added that, until he saw the video that Cho sent to NBC News, he never heard him say a complete sentence. 
The pastor also recalled that he told Cho's mother that he speculated Cho was autistic and he asked her to take him to a hospital, but she declined. Forbidden by federal law to disclose any record of disability or treatment, Westfield officials disclosed none of Cho's speech and anxiety-related problems to Virginia Tech. Demeanor at Virginia Tech in his freshman year at Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, Cho enrolled as an undergraduate major in business information technology, a program that included a combination of computer science and management coursework offered by the Pampling College of Business. By his senior year, Cho was majoring in English. Virginia Tech declined to divulge details about Cho's academic record and why he changed his major, citing privacy laws. At the time of the attacks, Cho lived with five roommates in Suite 2121, a three-room suite in Harper Hall, a dormitory that houses 249 co-ed students, located just west of Cochrane Hall on the Virginia Tech campus. Relationship with faculty professor Nikki Giovanni, who taught Cho in a poetry class in the fall of 2005, had him removed from her class because she found his behavior menacing. She recalled that Cho had a mean streak and described his writing as intimidating. Cho had intimidated female students by photographing their legs under their desks and by writing obscene, violent poetry. Giovanni offered that she was willing to resign before she would continue with him. About six weeks after the semester began, Giovanni wrote a letter to then department head Lucinda Roy, who removed Cho from the class. Roy alerted the student affairs office, the dean's office, and the campus police. But each office responded that there was nothing they could do if Cho made no overt threats against himself or others. After Giovanni was informed of the massacre, she remarked that, I knew when it happened that that's probably who it was, and would have been shocked if it wasn't Roy, who had taught Cho an introduction to poetry the previous year, described him as an intelligent man, and that he seemed to be an awkward, lonely and insecure student who never took off his sunglasses, even indoors. She described Cho's behavior as arrogant and obnoxious at times, and that she tried several different ways to help him. Roy declined to comment on Cho's writings, saying only in general that they seemed very angry. She added that Cho, when called on in class, would take 20 seconds to answer questions, and whispered his response. He also took cell phone pictures of her in class. After Roy became concerned with Cho's behavior and the themes in his writings, she started meeting with Cho to work with him one-on-one. -on -one. However, she soon became concerned for her safety, and told her assistant that she would use the name of a dead professor as a duress code, in order to alert the assistant to call security. After Roy notified authorities of Cho's behavior, she urged Cho to seek counseling, but to her knowledge, Cho never followed through with the request. When creative writing professor Lisa Norris, who taught Cho in both advanced fiction writing and contemporary fiction, was asked about him by Marianne Lewis, associate dean for liberal arts and human sciences. She was not told that he was suffering from mental health problems or about prior police reports concerning his harassment of female students, according to Norris. My guess is that either the information was not accessible to her, Lewis, or it was privileged and could not be released to me, Lewis told Norris, to recommend that Cho seek counseling at the on-campus Cook Counseling Center, as Lewis had already done. Relationship with students Fellow students described Cho as a quiet person who would not respond if someone greeted him. Student Julie Poole recalled the first day of a literature class the previous year when the students introduced themselves one by one. When it was Cho's turn to introduce himself, he did not speak. According to Poole, the professor looked at the sign-in sheet and found that, whereas all the others had written out their names, Cho had written only a question mark. Paul added that, we just really knew him as the question mark kid. 
Karen Gruel, who shared a suite with Cho at Harper Hall, reported that Cho would sit in a wood rocker by the window in his room at the dormitory and stare at the lawn below. According to Gruel, Cho appeared to never go to class or read a book during his senior year, adding that Cho just typed on his laptop went to the dining hall and clipped his hair in the bathroom, cleaning up the hair afterwards. Gruel also reported that he witnessed Cho riding his bicycle in circles in the parking lot of the dormitory. Andy Koch and John Ide, who once shared a room with Cho at Cochrane Hall during 2005 and 2006, stated that Cho demonstrated other repetitive behaviors, such as listening repeatedly to Shine by the alternative rock band Collective Soul. Cho wrote the song's lyrics, Teach me how to speak, teach me how to share, teach me where to go, on the wall of his dormitory room. Koch described two further unusual incidents including one where Cho stood in the doorway of his room late at night taking photographs of him and a second incident where Cho repeatedly placed harassing cell phone calls to Koch's Cho's brother, question mark, a name Cho also used when introducing himself to girls. Koch and I'd searched Cho's belongings and found a pocket knife, but they did not find any items that they deemed seriously threatening to them. Koch also described a telephone call that he received from Cho during the Thanksgiving holiday break from school. During that call, Koch said that Cho claimed to be vacationing with Vladimir Putin, with Cho adding, Yeah, we're in North Carolina, in response. Koch told him, I'm pretty sure that's not possible, sung, because of Cho's behavior. Koch and Ide, who had earlier tried to befriend him, gradually stopped talking to him and told their friends, especially female classmates, not to visit their room. Koch and Ide claimed Cho was involved in at least three stalking incidents, two of which resulted in verbal warnings by the Virginia Tech campus police. The first alleged stalking incident occurred on November 27, 2005. After the incident, according to Koch, Cho claimed to have sent an instant message online to the female student by AOL Instant Messenger and found out where she lived on the campus. I'd stated that Cho then visited her room to see if she was cool, adding that Cho remarked that he only found promiscuity in her eyes. I'd added that, when Cho visited the female student, Cho said, hi, I'm question mark, to her, which really freaked her out. The female student called the campus police, complaining that Cho had sent her annoying messages and made an unannounced visit to her room. Two uniformed members of the campus police visited Cho's room at the dormitory later that evening and warned him not to contact the female student. Again, Cho made no further contact with the student. The final alleged stalking incident came to light on December 13, 2005. In the preceding days, Cho had contacted a female friend of Koch via AIM and wrote on her door board a line from Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Act 2, Scene 2, in which Romeo laments to Juliet, by a name of I know not how to tell who I am. My name, dear saint, is hateful to myself because it is an enemy to thee. Had I written, I would tear the word. The young woman was initially unconcerned by Cho's aim messages and the Shakespearean message he left on her doorboard, until she was contacted by Andy Koch via aim. Koch told her that Cho was involved in an earlier stalking incident and that, I think he is schophrenic, sick. After Koch's encouragement, the young woman contacted the campus police, who again warned Cho against further unwanted contact. After that warning, Cho made no further contact with the second female student. Later the same day, Cho sent a text message to Koch with the words, I might as well kill myself now, worried that Cho was suicidal. Koch contacted his father for advice, and both of them contacted campus authorities. The campus police returned to the dormitory and escorted Cho to New River Valley Community Services Board the Virginia Mental Health Agency serving Blacksburg.